so uh, okay thank you i will start a, a presentation on uh, this update uh, lecture on uh, dysphagia uh, in general uh, to start with the definition of uh, dysphagia dysphagia is the subjective sensation of inability to swallow so it's more of a patient reported uh, complaint and uh, it's usually subjective so it, it it's a bit difficult it's not like the other conditions where you have the option of using uh, investigations or physical examination to to i mean to assess the complaints more of subjective and if the patient says that they're uh, having some form of inability to swallow then this is considered as uh, dysphagia uh, okay i don't know what this thing is so the approach in general for dysphagia is um, one is one you could classify it as uh, acute dysphagia and the non-acute dysphagia and uh, because the term there is no chronic dysphagia so it's better to say non-acute dysphagia one way of looking at it so the other option is uh, uh, classifying it as uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia and esophageal uh, dysphagia so that that would be a good entry point to to evaluate patients with dysphagia so when you see acute dysphagia usually acute dysphagia is caused by a foreign body impaction uh, it could be a footballer could be anything else and uh, patient the history would be quite suggestive the other form of acute dysphagia is usually neurologic causes so those patients with uh, some form of neurologic uh, uh, original problem like a stroke some cerebrovascular problem could present with acute dysphagia and usually this is an oropharyngeal uh, dysphagia I will, I will come to that a bit later on so approach to foreign bodies uh, it's uh, usually it's uh, an acute onset and the patients usually would report that they have uh, swallowed some uh, foreign bodies or a footballers which has caused uh, uh, dysphagia and uh, if the the foreign body is impacted below the aparesophageal sphincter patients could the airway could be patterned and as you know a number of patients uh, we've heard about cases where people died in in while eating food in with impacted for uh, footballers and uh, once the food makes it beyond the aparesophageal sphincter and they would be able to protect the airway and uh, there would be a suggestive history that would be present and uh, there will be associated symptoms like drooling of saliva if if uh, the uh, obstruction is quite proximal so as you can see here here is mangustu trying to manage a patient with a food impaction with uh, during the holiday season this is a couple of years ago so uh, here on the site you see where he's pointing at it's where the patient came with to uh, 24 hour more than 24 hour history of food impaction he came all the way from Awasa actually for endoscopic uh, removal here is you see the footballers which was impacted it was outside uh, actually and uh, it has caused the uh, drooling in the patient and as you can see if, if the patient st stayed um, longer i mean for a day there would be inevitable perforation because there is already development of some some superficial necrosis in this patient so another patient whom uh, we saw recently so so in the foreign bodies there, there would be some suggestive history and sometimes for those or, or, so this is a patient who swallowed a, a cork actually so there will be concomitant psychiatric problems sometimes so this patient actually swallowed a, a cork i think i have a i think and uh, as you can see there the endoscopically it could be managed so a good way to approach if it's an acute dysphagia benign cause it's um, usually uh, foreign body impaction okay so for non-acute dysphagia which is the commonest way you might see in, in, in your clinical practice uh, approach would be to see it as esophageal versus uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia and uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia is a difficulty of initiating swallow so patients here might have a problem with initiating uh, the swallowing process and they usually point towards the cervical region as the site of their symptoms origin of symptom and uh, the swallowing might be accompanied by nasopharyngeal regurgitation aspiration and the sensation of residual food remaining in the phallic so usually even the patient would say that they have a problem here around my neck and here uh, the approach would be considering oropharyngeal dysphagia and this is different from esophageal dysphagia be this is important because a number of systemic uh, conditions cause oropharyngeal dysphagia for example patients with a uh, muscle disorder like uh, myasthenia gravis those patients with systemic uh, also connective tissue disorders 
and uh, metabolic disorder, uh, as you can see, and uh, poisoning with botulism, for example, could cause oropharyngeal dysphagia. And uh, sometimes uh, interventions, uh, iatrogenic uh, medical condition could also cause oropharyngeal dysphagia. And a host of cause, a number of causes with uh, from uh, neurology are responsible for oropharyngeal dysphagia. So here it's, if you do an endoscopy, it's usually patent, you don't see anything. But the problem here is higher up in the oropharynx. So it's uh, about controlling the muscles in the oropharyngeal area. The workup is a bit different because uh, you, with upper jaw endoscopy, you might not be able to see anything in this uh, group of patients. So, so uh, identifying oropharyngeal dysphagia, this is the patient whom you get uh, a normal endoscopy report that the patient is complaining uh, dysphagia. Whereas esophageal dysphagia, this is difficulty of swallowing several seconds after initiating a swallow. So this is a bit different from the first one. Here, the difficulty is, the difficulty would persist after initiating a swallow. So this is usually, these are patients with mechanical problem uh, lower down in the esophagus. So the symptom actually persists several seconds into the initiation of a swallow. So, and the patient would have a sensation that food or liquid are being obstructed in their passage from the upper esophagus to the stomach, and the patients feel that, that they could not pass food beyond the, the esophagus. So here, the way you approach esophageal dysphagia is, uh, is it solid and liquid versus uh, solid only uh, dysphagia? And second approach, is it a progressive dysphagia, you know, gradual worsening, or uh, the dysphagia is happening intermittently? Uh, so, according to this approach, if a patient has a solid and liquid uh, food uh, dysphagia with progressive symptom, the condition that we uh, need to suspect is achalasia, actually. So here, the, the dysphagia is for both liquid and solid, and it's gradually progressive over a long period of time. And uh, achalasia is classical. It's a loss of the normal peristalsis in the distal esophagus and a failure of lower esophageal sphincter relaxation with the swelling. So previously it used to be considered as a one condition. Actually, they, now there are at least three uh, types of uh, dysphagia. So this is a, a, a esophageal manometry that you see. So I just uh, will show you uh, for a few seconds what it means. So here is uh, the upper esophageal sphincter. If you see uh, bright color, it means uh, the area is contracted. And the, the more the color changes to red, that means the pressure is higher. And if you, if you don't see colors, then it means it's relaxation. So normal physiology is that, as you can see here, there is a apresophageal sphincter opening, that means food coming in, there will be automatic relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter with a gradual uh, contraction of the different esophageal segments. As you can see, it, it, it comes down. So the first part should contract, and this is uh, through the timeline, and then gradually the next part should contract. And this is how a normal swallow is uh, affected. Uh, whereas if you see patients with achalasia, this is what it looks like. So there is initiation of a swallow here, and there is no relaxation in the lower esophageal sphincter. This is classic achalasia. It's type 1 with a current nomenclature. It's called type 1 achalasia. Whereas type 2 achalasia, there is initiation of swallow. Again, there is loss of relaxation, but there is no coordinated contraction. It's pan pressurization. That means throughout the esophagus, there is continuous contraction. That if, it's, if you compare it to the previous one, this one could push food down because the first part, when the first parts contract, the, the next parts are relaxing actually at the, that specific time. And uh, when the second part uh, contracts, there is gradual increment in pressure. So that's how food travels down the esophagus. But here, as you can see, the entire esophagus is contracting at one time. So food cannot pass this way. And there is failure of relaxation. In type three, again, there is a uh, esophageal spasm, as you can see, the in almost more than half of the esophagus is in this um, red color. That means it's very, it's contracting very vigorously. So it's esophageal spasm. Again, food cannot pass down. But classically, esophageal achalasia is defined by the failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter with impediment in the progression of uh, so the peristalsis. So uh, achalasia is suspected when, uh, so there is dysphagia on solids and liquids. There is heartburn and responsive to trial of proton pump inhibitor therapy. So here it's not because of the acid actually that the patients have heartburn. This is because of the retained food 
which is fermented in the esophagus and the fermentation, as you know, releases acid. And that acid is the reason for the heartburn usually in these patients with dyspagia. So when upper jaw endoscope is done, there might be retained food. And there is an usually increased resistance to passage of endoscope through the esophagogastric junction. <laughs> So, so the role of uh, in endoscopy in achalasia is actually to exclude malignancy and uh, pseudoachalasia is uh, actually any condition which causes obstruction in the lower esophageal sphincter area. Could be malignancy from the stomach, which might uh, appear like uh, uh, achalasia. So in, the, in, in setups like ours where uh, there is a lack of motility study, it, it is the first investigation to make a diagnosis or suspicion for a diagnosis of uh, achalasia actually. So BRM studies uh, actually could show better findings because BRM is a dynamic study and the patients swallow the BRM and the radiologists could see the food progressing down. Uh, but uh, regardless, in, in, in the standard practice is that there is a, you need esophageal manometry to at least to classify which type of achalasia is the patient having. I mean, if it's advanced, then it might be quite obvious that this is achalasia. But in those patients with, uh, I mean, early forms of achalasia, you might miss it with an upper jaw endoscopy. So there are different management options for uh, achalasia. There is a medical therapy uh, drugs. And the, there is a pneumatic dilation. It's called POEM, which is paroral endoscopic myotomy. And then there is a surgical uh, management. So medical therapy, it entails uh, usually calcium channel brokers and nitrates. So these drugs are actually of limited efficacy. So the, the, usually there might be some improvement of symptoms, but the patient actually, there, there would be uh, an optimal response for most patients actually. So it might be used for those patients who are unwilling to take, uh, to undergo procedures or unable to undergo procedures for some uh, comorbidity. So it's not used. I mean, you might see some patients being started on these drugs, but it's not, Honestly, it's not that helpful for me, majority of patients. It's always good to plan for uh, management with uh, the other options. Second is uh, pneumatic dilation. So this is a, using a large pneumatic balloon. So this is not the balloon which we use for esophageal strictures for other causes, but this is like a large pneumatic balloon and it should be done uh, under fluoroscopy, under X-ray vision. It has a very high success rate, actually. It's quite equivalent, almost equivalent to surgical intervention, and it's a first-line therapy in, in majority of centers, actually. So pneumatic dilation is the preferred uh, option. So we actually did uh, some pneumatic dilation in the past, and also presented this poster at you know, the EMA a couple of years ago. As you can see here on the, on the picture, there is a waist, that means the uh, contraction site uh, of the lower esophageal sphincter and with the inflation of the balloon, the waste was broken and uh, this patient actually had a marked response with uh, pneumatic dilation. The problem with pneumatic dilation, you need, it's not an endoscopic procedure, it's a fluoroscopic procedure. Using an endoscopy you could put a marker and this is uh, the marker here as you can see the blade on the external body surface. And then using that marker, you go in with a fluoroscope and inflate the balloon and break the waist of the lower esophageal sphincter. The aim is to break the muscle layer. It's not the, to break the mucosal layer. So, so there is a difference in, in terms of aim. So this is Johannes doing actually that procedure with us. And uh, what he was, what he's having on his hand is the, the balloon actually, it's a big balloon. And it's done under, uh, as you can see, with fluoroscopy. Since the fluoroscopy machine in our hospital is not working, currently we're not doing this, but uh, the, the balloon is available. POEM is uh, the recent introduction into management of achalasia and in big specialized centers in the world. Nowadays, POEM is a common procedure for achalasia. What POEM does is, as you can see, this is pictorial representation of POEM. So the, there is entry into the submucosa using uh, the scope. And the once uh, they, they open a tunnel in the submucosa, then you could start to do with uh, myotomy from the inside. So traditionally surgery used to be done from the outside. You could go in and uh, do, uh, I mean, incision of the muscle, break the muscle from the outside. With POEM, what's done is uh, the incision is done from the luminal aspect. So as you can see, there is myotomy being done here. The muscle is broken and the subcutaneous, the submucosal uh, tunnel is closed with a, with a clip. I mean, uh, it, nowadays it's, it's fairly common procedure being done elsewhere in many parts of the world. 
surgical management it's open or laparoscopic heller uh, myotomy in our in our setup it's open uh, myotomy so it has uh, its own attendant risks of uh, i mean post op uh, complications are there so that's why people prefer to uh, go, go with pneumatic dilation because pneumatic dilation is a, a day procedure i mean the patient whom you saw earlier was was managed in the morning and she was discharged late in the evening actually you could keep the patient even for a day but uh, the complication rate is lower with pneumatic dilation botulinum injection this is botox it's not a first line therapy and this is for patients who can't undergo other procedures this is an endoscopic injection therapy there is high relapse rate with botox usually it lasts for 6 to 12 months so it's good for patients with limited life expectancy or other comorbidities so this with is benign uh, again uh, if it is solid and progressive it likely causes usually stricture so in, in adults, the common, the common cause of stricture are um, peptic stricture and caustic stricture, especially in, in, in our setup. So caustic stricture, this, the, the common cause is ingestion of strong alkali, actually. This is uh, uh, drain cleaners and other household cleaning products, disc batteries. So this is a classic case whom uh, we saw earlier, where uh, these are young patients, female usually, for many reasons, people might uh, want to commit suicide and uh, they drink the cleaning product like traditionally called barakina. And uh, with that, the, this is an alkali injury. Acid injury is not common because uh, caustic, the alkali injury is quite, uh, quite aggressive to the esophagus. And uh, it's, it has to do with the mode of necrosis that they induce with either it's a liquefactive necrosis in the esophagus. So, uh, Acid injury usually the damage is in the stomach actually around the pylorus, whereas alkali injury is in the esophagus. And this is usually post suicide attempt actually for many reasons. This is a paper from the, in, in, in Africa. This is trying to see corrosive esophageal injury. So, of those patients who ingested um, uh, alkaline, 78%. Uh, of the patients are 78% uh, of the patients had uh, alkali ingestion as a cause, and of this 43% actually developed esophageal stricture. So, the outcome after that uh, ingestion of alkali is usually esophageal stricture, and uh, they end up in GI care in the majority of patients. And uh, there are different uh, uh, offending agents, as you can see, there are drain cleaners, oven cleaners and ammonia. These are household and, uh, and toilet cleaners. And uh, now it's the classic is Barakina. Uh, so it, it varies, I mean, from setup, but at least one third to, uh, to a half of patients actually could develop a stricture. And uh, it has to do with the depth of injury in the esophageal mucosa, and usually occurs after two, two months of corrosive ingestion, actually. So uh, concomitant with the psychiatric evaluation, most patients end up in, in GI uh, for management of uh, this, this uh, stricture. Uh, why do these patients develop dysphagia? One is obvious because of mechanical obstruction because food cannot pass down. Second is because of interruption of the swallowing waves coming from proximal esophagus to the distal esophagus. So, so PRM could show uh, solitary multiple structures of varying lengths and um, there might be diverticula also from injury in these patients. You don't usually need BRM study for measured patients with esophageal uh, stricture, and uh, but it's always good to have it because uh, you could show complex esophageal stricture. I mean, if it's complex, even for planning of management, you require a BRM study. But since considering cost for a number of patients, uh, we, we do endoscopy first and then assess the stricture proximally. And to get a, a full view, you might do a BRM study. From uh, South Africa, when they try to look uh, uh, the cause for uh, stricture, a majority are alkali again. Alkali, uh, this is a, so a part of suicide attempt or accidental ingestion of the alkaline uh, material. This is a similar study. Uh, simple strictures are usually related to peptic stricture. This is as part of gastroesophageal re reflex disease. This is a smooth surface, short, straight, uh, located usually in the distal esophagus. And then with a couple of sessions, you could, do, uh, you could uh, break it and then go into the stomach quite easily. And it's not resistant. 
And these peptic structures are actually occur as part of healing of erosions which were caused by GERD, actual gastroesophageal reflex disease. And uh, it's associated with longer duration of disease and older age. And uh, the way you manage these peptic structures is by giving patients PPI and endoscopic uh, dilation. This is a young patient who had, uh, who had uh, been managed uh, in our setup. As you can see here, this is his second or third dilation. It was being uh, here. So uh, this is after breaking the structure and going into the stomach. This is distal in the distal esophagus. Actually, he's managed with PPI and he did not come back uh, because the structure was effectively managed. He was our patient. Whereas complex structures are very difficult to manage. These are long, narrow, tortuous structures and uh, there might be diverticula associated uh, with that. It's not, it might not be as simple as that. Uh, yeah. So these are patients usually with caustic ingestion. Um, similar study. So the way you dilate these caustic structures, is, uh, what you have two options. One is using a balloon and the other is using mechanical dilators. It's a Savary dilator or Maloney dilator. This is, these are their names. So we, we, we have both these uh, machines uh, in these accessories in our in our hospital also here in black line and uh, what balloon dilators do is that you ex expand the balloon inside the structure site and um, and then trying to uh, deliver a, a radial force I mean, a circumferential force into the structure site and then gradually increase the size of the balloon to achieve luminal patency these are, this is the technique so I mean you know, many of the residents might, might have seen this being done. So the, you start with a smaller balloon and increase gradually the size, and this is how you apply the the inflation. This, so this is the inflator, and you can see the pressure here. Like just it looks like the BP cuff, the BP pressure reader, and then the balloon is subsequently inflated. So this is a pictorial representation what's being done. So once you find the stricture site, you put the balloon in between the stricture site and then inflate the balloon and then break the mucosa, which is causing the, the stricture. So you have to be very careful not to do uh, too much inflation and so that uh, you, you don't cause perforation of the esophagus. It's a patient, well-known patient in our uh, hospital here. She's a patient from Asmara who came for this purpose. This is uh, while we did uh, the sixth uh, session, I think, uh, sixth session uh, of dilation. So this is a patient with caustic uh, injury. She tried to commit su suicide in, in Asmara for some reason. And so it's here, as you can see, the balloon is being inflated in the, in the esophagus and uh, the stricture site is being dilated. As you can see here, the balloon is inflated in, and uh, there is a small diverticula. I don't think you could see it from this angle, but the balloon is being inflated here. So uh, initially the first and second sessions was very narrow. You couldn't even insert this balloon and then gradually it was being opened. She had a gradual progressive uh, swelling of uh, and opening of the structure. Here you could see diverticula here. Here is a diverticula from the caustic ingestion also. So it was opened with this uh, uh, balloon, with this session. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, again. So this is after opening. So this site is opened, but uh, she had a gradual, uh, I think at least four level structure and uh, she required multiple sessions. I think she's still on uh, follow up and uh, undergoing different sessions. So the second option is Savary dilator. So Savary is uh, we insert a wire and then through the wire we insert a dilator. So this is not an endoscopic procedure. This, I mean, you could start with endoscopy and put in a wire and uh, through the wire you insert uh, the dilator. And, uh, Increase, gradually increase the, the buji, the dilator buji. So we have this uh, savary dilation. So we usually do it here for those patients who we know where uh, the anatomy is, uh, is predictable and use barium. Because if, if you are not sure about the type of the structure, it's, you might end up in the mediastinum, but that perforating the esophageal wall. And preferably this is done under fluoroscopy. Since our fluoroscopy is not working this time around, we do it for, and limit the number of patients whom we are comfortable that the anatomy is quite predictable after seeing the body. The balloon is uh, safer. I mean, it's there under direct uh, vision, but uh, uh, 
the savary dilator actually you could apply a radial in the longitudinal pressure force to the to the to the to the structure site otherwise they are quite comparable uh, i mean the indication might differ but uh, the in terms of outcome uh, the savary dilator and the balloon dilator usually are comparable so it's patient characteristics which dictates the choice of uh, the strict the choice of technique so sessions, I mean, we have done here, I think Dr. Johannes has uh, one patient whom he has done I mean, 12, 14 times. You have one patient whom we know we have done 18 times sessions. So patients require multiple sessions actually. So these are patients whom we do procedure every two weeks, sometimes every week. And uh, sometimes patients disappear from follow-up and they come back with worsening of stricture. So, uh, I mean, repeated sessions are indicated for a majority of patients. And once you reach at 80 millimeter, 18 is very, I mean, it's quite big. And dysphagia symptom occurs at 13 millimeter. So preferably, I mean, for a large bolus food, 80 millimeter might be a safer range to reach as in the point of dilation. And uh, this is a kaplan meier curve from a recent uh, publication and uh, dilation up to 50 millimeter showing that this is uh, a good end point so the complication of dilation is the perforation so, so the, you might uh, perforate but uh, if, if uh, it's done proper, properly in terms of the technique then the success rate is quite high steroid injection is other uh, option of management so here also in our hospital we do in steroid injection for a uh, quite a number of patients, and uh, this is injecting triamycillin into the stricture site. So the idea is to prevent healing by fibrosis. And uh, previous, I mean, back in the days, we are not injecting steroids initially, and after the initiation of steroid injection, the response rate for uh, this, uh, especially peptic and uh, caustic strictures, the response rate has been quite uh, dramatic, and it, it, it's quite helpful in terms of achieving a good dilation. So this is a comparison of uh, esophageal injection and the injection has shown to be helpful in steroid injection has been helpful in achieving a good dilation in majority of patients. Currently, the, there are stents. Stents could be inserted into a stricture site, but uh, we, we don't apply stents here for, for a stricture. We have a, a limited number of stents for esophagus and uh, most of them are not indicated for esophageal stricture actually. Uh, as a last resort, maybe some, some uh, a, a needle knife, you, using a needle knife, there might be an attempt to, to open the stricture side. So this is like uh, with the small uh, lumen size, there might be incision can be done into the lumen. And then uh, this incision could be gradually widened. And this is uh, using a needle knife. But it, 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 the risk of perforation actually is quite high using a needle knife to open esophageal stricture sites. So this is when dilation and the, the, using balloon and savary fails actually. Surgical options, some patients who fail therapy endoscopic management might, might be uh, candidates for a surgical intervention actually. So coming back to dysphagia, so the, the remaining group of uh, patients are this is uh, dysphagia with intermittent dysphagia and for solid food actually. If you get a patient, patient with history of uh, uh, intermittent dysphagia and for solid food and then in between being fine, then you have suspect possibility of rings, esophageal waves needs to be suspected and other differential diagnosis to consider is uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. These are common cause of dysphagia. As you know, with iron deficiency anemia, you have plumber Vincent syndrome. I didn't bring the pictures here, but we had at least four or five patients with classic plumber Vincent syndrome in association with iron deficiency anemia, which occur, this occurs in the proximal esophagus. The other is cut ring, which is found in the distal esophagus actually. Sometimes patients might have a ring in the distal esophagus. And when they try to consume a large bolus food, uh, there might be occlusion impaction in the distal. This is called a steakhouse syndrome because it occurs usually in places when patients consume steak and uh, because of the large bolus size and uh, they could cause, uh, they could come with dysphagia during that period of time. It's a good example. This is a patient who, who this is around, uh, I think, Ethiopian Christmas. This is a patient who came with uh, impaction of food on a ring actually. And uh, 
this is chicken for for the holiday of the Christmas, and uh, as you can see, it it has uh, occluded the lumen in the study so far. So uh, this is a retrieval with uh, the basket actually. So the, the, in between these patients are quite comfortable, and it's not like patients with caustic or peptic stricture where they have dysphagia for a major period of time. But these patients come with uh, dysphagia for when, they, especially during holiday season, for some reasons for when they try to consume large bolus food. And this patient actually was managed with endoscopic removal of uh, um, the, the food bolus. And once the food bolus is open, uh, removed, and uh, as you can see here, there is a ring here in circular. There is a ring it's around uh, the distal esophagus. So he was managed endoscopically. So uh, other cause of dysphagia, are, this is uh, quite straightforward. It's patients with anastomosis for esophageal CA, they might develop uh, stricture. The other is, is extra luminal compression. Any cause from outside the esophagus could compress on the esophagus and cause uh, dysphagia. Peel esophagitis, especially in association with uh, uh, doxycycline, iron, KCL tablet, uh, they, they could cause uh, pili esophagitis. And usually patients also have concomitant odinophagia. And the eosinophilic esophagitis is a good cause for uh, intermittent dysphagia and it has a classic uh, endoscopic uh, feature. And these are uh, the differential diagnosis of benign cause of dysphagia. As you can see, the important ones to know are reflex disease, caustic injury causing esophageal stricture, and from the motility disorders, uh, achalasia and then extra luminal compression of the esophagus. And as a conclusion, it's a common complaint. Dysphagia is a common complaint and a simplified approach in terms of the onset of symptom and in terms of progression of symptom is, is good to reach out a diagnosis in majority of patients. Multiple options of management are available in the management of achalasia and the stricture, as you can, I, I think, knowing that uh, these management options are available and a number of them are actually available here in our hospital also. And uh, uh, management uh, options are quite there. And it's good to know what, what, what could be done for this uh, group of patients. And uh, this is what I have. Uh, thank you. And if you have questions, I'm willing to answer. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ami, for the wonderful and informative lecture. Uh, so anyone with uh, questions or comments? Uh, so Dr. Yeah, Dr. Amir. Yes. It was an excellent presentation. In fact, a very nice synopsis. What I would like to ask you is, you know, with achalasia, does it matter, you know, cold, hot meal, the precedence to fall solid to liquid? You know, in the old days when we were taught with achalasia, the first problem is encountered with. Uh, with liquids and then comes to, you know, these are the kind of history yeah. stuff, that, yeah. but if it is valid. Yeah, so uh, the, the way you look at it is usually dysphagia is associated with, solid, with uh, solid food, right? For a stricture, for a malignancy, so for just in the like, but unusually in motility disorder, especially in, in uh, achalasia, because the dysphagia occurs uh, at the same time for the liquid and solid, patients tend to report that they have uh, also inability to to swallow liquid. So that, that actually dominates the history. In terms of uh, statistical significance, there might not be a significant difference, but the fact that the patient that cannot consume uh, liquids is, is a flag sign for majority of patients. They tend to report that early on on their, uh, on their presentation. So that has to do with uh, re reported history that it's uh, liquid dysphagia can usually at, at the same time as the solid dysphagia in, in uh, achalasia. Okay, uh, so in the meantime, Dr. Amir, you have one question in the chat box from Dr. Udaki. So what is the role of endoscopic intervention in an external compression causing significant dysphagia? Oh, I mean, extra luminal compression because uh, the, mus the mucosa is quite intact and uh, the problem is occurring from outside the esophagus. The definitive management is in, uh, I mean, uh, handling the extra esophageal issue. I mean, if it's malignancy of something else, removing those things might be helpful. But uh, if if patient is not a good candidate, one one option you could try is maybe putting in a stent and uh, keeping patency of the is because in a rigid stents then compression risk of compression actually is reduced. So but since we don't have that stent, it it might be a bit difficult. The other thing is 
the size of the stent may not fit actually in, in structure it's you have graded the stents here since the lumen is quite open this, there might be slippage of stent so otherwise uh, since the mucosa is intact health management is definite definitive management should be geared towards the extra issue okay. so any other questions or comments Yes, Hello? Professor, you can proceed. Yes. Uh, yes. For present. Thank you for research and, uh, and uh, presentation. Hello. Hear me, Dr. Abi. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes, thank you. So it's oftentimes uh, delayed in the uh, so it's sometimes confused with other like uh, pseudobulbosy, laryngeal lesions that can confuse with the sphere. Uh, uh, one who presented with after three months, and it was really risky. Uh, because the bone in the tissue and cannot try to remove this endoscopically because of risk of perforation. And uh, another young patient from Jijiga who presented two months after swallowing uh, the battery, disc battery, which has acidic uh, effect on the tissue and it resulted in esophagia. So, it's very important that you brought up this uh, because oftentimes, sometimes we encounter a patient coming with complaints actually that could have been uh, treated earlier. In achalasia, as you right said, it's a fibrous uh, process. So uh, the poem is, and I think the X way because it, it, it cuts the fibrosis uh, before myotomy, uh, fibrotic. All of industry for X luminal uh, complexion. Doctor was trying to put uh, lumen for the symptom uh, stent for the. I think EUS endoscopic ultrasound can also help us to diagnose and uh, what is compression from extra luminal. You can know it uh, by imaging method. To mention few uh, these few, points. otherwise it's an excellent. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, if there are any questions or comments, feel uh, so. Uh, yeah, so if there are no questions, or further questions or comments, so uh, have, can you see the results of the post it, Dr. Amit? Yes. Yes, yes, I could see. So, majority have responded. Uh, correctly actually so it's a first patient is a middle east returnee so epidemiologically you see that uh, these uh, young ladies coming from middle east countries actually they try to attempt suicide by ingesting um, the bleach toilet ma cleaning material and then they come with caustic structure so it's a uh, usual epidemiologically speaking even with the barium finding it's highly suggestive that this is caustic structure a number of our patients are like that actually in our hospital. The other is regarding aglesia, pneumatic dilation is a first line therapy. And as you can see, as you can see, the treatment using medical therapy is not optimal. It's not for majority of patients in surgical intervention is done for if the other management options fail. So both are correct, uh, re responded correctly actually. Thank you so much. So if there are any additional comments, Questions? We have two minutes. Uh, not. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, we will end up our morning session. Have a good day.